Kessler, and I'm the Counseling Component Specialist for IFMA. I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar brought to us by the Corporate Facilities Council. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to you, Wayne. Thank you, Mary. Uh, this is Wayne Weitzel, and I'm here with Stephanie Cole. We're with uh, Retrocom Energy Strategies. And let me uh, move to the next slide here. So a little quick little thing about Retrocom Energy Strategies. We're a national company. Um, we service uh, buildings both in the federal space through GSA as well as in the uh, private commercial space. And what we're going to talk today about is uh, playing the game of energy reduction strategies. And really, we are talking about something that is a game. Um, Part, part of that implies that there's players that we have to understand, we have to know what their roles are and how those players interact. So with that, let's, let's get started. There's a problem, okay? There's a problem in how we treat this issue. Are we treating symptoms or are we going to cure a disease? And quite simply, our failure to capture more energy efficient opportunities in our facilities is not due to a lack of funding. It's largely due because our traditional approach does not address the real issues. So what we're going to do is really unpack some of these uh, motivations that the players have uh, on your team and see how we can get those players to align and interact in a different way to help us actually make a difference. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Stephanie Culp. Stephanie? Good morning. Um, one, one of the first things we all need to do when we start to look at building systems and buildings and how they operate and environmental mandates and energy efficiency mandates is begin to understand where we are now. Um, in some ways, this is like psychology. We need to look at ourselves before we can actually um, create the uh, solutions to problems. And some of the things we're dealing with now that have changed over the tw last 25 or 50 years is that the, the complexity of buildings um, essentially outpaces uh, operator skills. Um, mo many of the solutions that we provide in buildings are driven by vendors, so they are very narrow and um, very structured to satisfy their particular offering. They're, they tend to be piecemeal. Um, we're very occupant focused in buildings. In other words, we've become very reactive to uh, comfort and heating and cooling complaints in buildings and that tends to drive our thinking in what really represents a, an effective O&M program be, uh, versus one that does not. Um, and few FMs that we work with are working from any kind of an environmental or energy plan. And um, obviously, you can't measure something if you do not have a plan in place to measure your progress against that. So um, let's talk a little bit more about the state we're in. Complexity and sophistication in building systems, as I said, has outpaced the skill levels of those responsible for them. We, we essentially care for buildings today the same way we did 50 years ago, and much of that is about uptime of the equipment. Um, and as I think everyone who's on this call understands, that uptime does not necessarily mean uh, efficiency. Um, in many cases, FMs with little or no knowledge of the technologies that are in their building uh, mistakenly assume that their building engineer is an expert in all of those things. And very few FMs have developed and are working from that strategic energy plan. Something on paper, a map, a plan on where you need to go over the longer term. And so when we look at O&M programs in, in that light, we tend to evaluate uh, almost exclusively based on an occupant-centric um, viewpoint. In other words, if we're not getting complaints as facility managers, then obviously nothing is wrong in the building. And perhaps one of the last things that is a reality that we've come across in so many cases is that the formal training for building engineers has tended to be very, very traditional. In other words, it's about greasing, oiling, uptime, tenant complaints, and many of those issues that we've been dealing with historically in buildings for the last 50 to 75 years. 
So what we need to do before we really begin to plan energy is we really need to understand who the primary players are um, relative to how efficiency interacts with operations and maintenance activities. And there's many people involved in this, the building engineers, contractors and vendors, facility managers and the building occupants. They all have varying motivations for either their wants or needs or an understanding of how they are to interact with that system. So what we want to do is we want to walk through each one of these players and give everyone an understanding of what we believe from our experience in buildings to be their particular motivation in interacting with the operation of the building from an energy and environmental perspective. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention, I did mention this earlier, is that if anyone does have questions, please use the chat box uh, in your, in your uh, GoToMeeting window pane. We'll be addressing questions at the end. Uh, thank you. So let's start off by looking at the facility manager at the top of that pyramid. Um, facility management education in general has really not kept pace with the real life issues that impact building system performance. In other words, um, we daily come across facility managers in all kinds of facilities who really don't understand the nuances of uh, energy and maintenance management principles and wrongly assume that their, uh, their, their building engineers actually do. And in many cases, those building engineers um, actually do understand how to keep equipment running and they're very effective individuals. But because the job descriptions have become so narrow, we tend to have building engineers who don't look at a larger picture. So, I, you know, we would support in any way uh, an improvement in the education on how facility managers actually interact with the building engineers that are in their building. Um, most FMs would have a difficult time assessing the effective abilities of their engineering staff. So the question that comes from that essentially says, well, on what basis did we hire those FMs? How did we make sure that those folks actually do know how to operate the building? And in many cases, the questions are, are more uh, assumptions on our part as facility managers because we assume that if you're a building engineer and perhaps you belong to a building engineering union or those sorts of things, then you must have training. And we kind of take for granted that those folks go out and they do exactly what they want. So one of the areas where we could really focus our attention is on assessing the staff that we actually hire. How effective are they? Um, do they, do they have the skills that are necessary in order to create a uh, sound energy management plan for the, the systems that they take care of, or are they primarily complaint driven? And you know, FMs universally confuse the lack of complaints in their buildings with uh, effective O&M activities. In other words, if you're not receiving calls from the occupants in the building in terms of heating and cooling, then uh, obviously the building must be running correctly. And that is almost universally not the case. Um, the most important thing a building engineer can do, and this is a really, really important point, and to understand where this thinking comes from, the most important thing a building engineer can do is to actually avoid receiving calls. Those building engineers do not wish to have a third or fourth call from the same place. So we have to assume as facility managers and consultants that that individual is going to that space no matter what the case may be because all buildings have issues with comfort, uh, ventilation. That individual is going to that space and doing whatever is necessary in order to correct that problem. Because as a facility manager, uh, if you've received a third or fourth complaint from a specific area in the building and it has not been addressed by your uh, building engineer, 
then it's going to become questionable on, in your mind on whether or not that building engineer is actually effective at his job. So that motivation really short circuits the whole performance-based operations and maintenance uh, uh, mentality in existing buildings. And it creates a significant gap between what is possible and what is efficient. And perhaps the last thing that we really need to talk about in terms of how a facility manager um, interacts with his building from, a, from an energy and environmental perspective is that in many cases we do not have a strategic plan that allows us to create a roadmap for where we want to go. I have come across in my career of about 25 years very few individuals who can pull a plan out of the drawer and say, this is how we're going to approach energy and environmental issues. And this impacts both the cost of energy inefficiency and LEED certification, golden or uh, uh, green globe certification, all of those issues that we're now facing over the last 10 years. Um, energy prices are not going to drop. And, you know, a strategic energy plan is essentially as vital as a business plan. It is part of a business plan. And because energy takes up such a significant portion of everyone's budget, we do ourselves a significant disservice by ignoring uh, a real functional planning process to get at those issues. So let's move on to see, talk a little bit about the building engineer. For the most part, we maintain buildings the same way we've been maintaining them for the last 50 to 75 years. In other words, we are driven by uptime, and uptime also impacts occupancy comfort. In other words, uh, uptime for uh, one specific area of the building may mean something different than another specific area of the building, depending on the kind of issues that that come up as a result of uh, changing occupant needs. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is the fact that building engineers is really a misnomer. These folks are not engineers. And in some cases, um, they have little or no formal training. In smaller buildings, we often come across folks that, who were two weeks ago were janitors, and now they're the building engineer. Um, in almost all of the facilities we work in, it is assumed that the building engineer is completely familiar with how everything works, and that is not the case. And although most building engineers do have a reasonable understanding and some background training in how to maintain the mechanical equipment in their facility, unfortunately their focus remains on uptime. And that goes back to that 50-year mentality of uh, how buildings should operate. If we take a very, very close look at O&M tasking schedules for both contractors, um, vendors, controls contractors, and even the in internal O&M staff, when we do reviews of those types of, of uh, documents, we seldom see anything that has to do with energy performance-based um, tasking and activities. And just as an example, so you understand the critical nature of that, I have in the last 10 or 15 years in reviewing uh, dozens and dozens of maintenance task lists for large buildings with huge energy bills, seldom seen any kind of activities on a even quarterly basis that might ensure that the economizers are working in the building. And for those of you who don't understand what an economizer do, does, it essentially allows you to use outside air when that temperature is below the set point of the interior of the building. In other words, when the demand of the building itself can be satisfied by outside air, then we use that outside air in order to perform cooling in the building. And at some point in time when that outside air starts to drive past that set point, then the outside air dampers close to a minimum position and allow the mechanical cooling to come on. 
one of the most common things that we see in tasking and the things we witness in existing buildings is poorly sequenced uh, economizer systems. In other words, you can walk into the air plenum and see that the dampers are wide open at 100% and the chiller is running at 75% to, uh, to satisfy the needs of the space. Well, obviously, if you're bringing in hot outside air, then you're just creating additional demand on the chiller. And that's just an inefficient way of, of approaching um, ventilation in a building and cooling in a building. So one of the things that we need to do is really need to get into the nuts and bolts when we begin to develop an energy plan, get into the nuts and bolts of what the actual O&M plan is. What are those activities looking like? And, you know, this is not only a problem for vendors coming into the building because we see the equally, um, uh, equally vacant uh, tasking and activities in vendor specifications uh, as we do in internal specifications. So um, when you couple that with the fact that most building engineers either have little training or not supported by ongoing trading that is essentially performance-based, then how is the building engineer or even the facility manager going to determine whether or not the internal operations and maintenance procedures or those procedures sold to you by vendors are actually effect, effective in keeping energy costs down or meeting any environmental, um, any environmental demands? So we really do need to realize that building engineers are an incredibly important uh, aspect of how efficient the building will operate. And that's an obvious to all of us, I know. However, what we fail to do is we fail to understand that the education, the management, the dependency on vendors that ongoing training method and our somewhat obsolete methods for actually taking, um, taking care of our buildings it, it is like a perfect storm to create inefficiency in a building. So let's move on now to contractors and vendors so that we can understand what kinds of motivations exist for these folks. Um, most of the vendors that you deal with, and it's very common for you to have in an existing building to have a controls vendor who have maybe has a service contract that runs uh, eight hours a month, um, or have a mechanical services contractor who comes in and does quarterly uh, maintenance on all of those pieces of equipment. Now these folks in their own area of expertise actually do know how to provide value to, to their clients. And um, most of that value can be translated into energy and environmental value and energy efficiency value, but we're failing to recognize that our building engineers, because of their backgrounds, often have little or no capability of determining what should actually happen or what kind of services are appropriate for the internal workings of that building. And after working in the controls industry for about a dozen years, um, I can tell you for certain that 90% of the controls industry service contracts that are provided actually add little value. And let's remember that controls vendors in particular, and I don't want to beat them up too much in, in case we have some of you uh, attending the, the, um, the webinar, but controls vendors um, will typically provide services um, that are somewhat based on what the building engineer wants, but also somewhat based on what their recommendations tell that building engineer um, that they need for their building. And understand that they want to sell you new controls contracts and new control systems. That's how they do business in those buildings. But it's also important to understand that the control side of your building, the, the, those, those systems that actually operate heating, ventilation, air conditioning, domestic water, um, and all those other energy consuming systems including lighting, um, 
those systems, if they're not in tune, um, do not provide any kind of efficiency to the building. In other words, if you're not operating the equipment in the building effectively, then you're certainly not going to get energy efficiency out of it. There's been a number of studies done by Energy Star that show that most buildings with VAV and uh, high efficiency chilled water systems um, actually operate no better than those buildings that are that do not contain those types of high efficiency systems. And this is primarily a cause of how the control system interacts with those particular pieces of equipment in a building. So creating efficiency, the basis of creating efficiency in existing buildings is essentially based on how that control system operates. You can have the most efficient equipment um, in your building, but if you're not controlling it correctly. So when you add to that the fact that the building engineer really has very little understanding of how those systems work, in other words, that control system. And I'm going to point out that if you asked your building engineer in many cases, I would say this is probably 75 to 90 percent of the cases, to reprogram or set up a new sequence of operation for the controls in his or her building, the likelihood is, is that they would call the controls vendor and have them come in and do that. And it's sad for us to see that in most cases when controls vendors come in under a contract that essentially is only hours uh, per month, that the, the building engineer is, because of their background and their, their lack of understanding of how buildings actually should operate, um, essentially leaves it up to the controls contractor to provide the services and design what those services are. So in many cases it's about uh, addressing alarm issues, it's about looking at um, particular problems of sensors that might have failed, rather than calibration, um, resequencing, rescheduling, uh, uh, redoing or re repairing reset schedules, um, and doing some of the things that actually do provide performance in the building. Now, the other area where performance or where performance is essentially um, short circuited by, by the controls industry is. Um, when we start talking about upgrades, the controls industry, we need to understand, is not a lot different than, um, than the software industry. In other words, just like we have to upgrade from Windows XP to Windows Professional to Windows 7 um, and uh, upgrade our Adobe systems, the same is true with control systems in buildings. Essentially, they're computerized systems that actually run the building systems. So one of the questions we often ask ourselves and we ask building engineers to, uh, to um, ask themselves is, is that upgrade really necessary? In other words, does the system actually provide any additional value by upgrading the software packages? Or would calibration of thermostats and all the other devices in the building that operate equipment and systems be a better route to go? And by and large, considerably less expensive. So we need to understand that contractors and vendors will have a, have a singular focus. They're there to sell you whatever high efficiency systems they can sell you. And so we need to take that advice often with a grain of salt. And if we take that advice with a grain of salt, with an underlying understanding that our plan is to reach a certain point from a strategic energy and environmental perspective, then we can pick and choose those systems or those solutions that actually do make sense for us. So just remember that when you're talking to vendors and, and contractors, yes, they can provide value, information, and advice. But we need to stop the tendency to take a knee-jerk reaction to treating symptoms rather than the disease in the building. And I, I can see, Stephanie, how having that strategic plan would be a, a great way to measure uh, these incoming suggestions from contractors and vendors. If it aligns with the strategic plan you've created, you can, you can have some value and marry those things together. And it gives you a good way to judge those suggestions from vendors and contractors. Yes. 
So building occupants, and we're not going to talk a long time about building occupants. We all understand implicitly that we need to provide a comfortable environment. It needs to be a healthy environment. We need to meet ASHRAE standards in terms of fresh air. And um, we need to provide a healthy workplace for these folks. And um, I, you know, it's probably uh, it's probably not important to understand that a healthy workplace is also a very productive workplace. But we also need to understand that what drives the um, the relationship between facility managers, building engineers, and even vendors to a, to an extent is response to complaints. And when we let response to complaints drive our decision making relative to the efficiency of our buildings, then we are doing the equipment and systems in that building and our energy bill a disservice. Um, if we have complaints and uh, hot cold calls from particular areas in a building, it's not enough for us to go there and just fix it. We need to understand why we have that. And if you step back a little bit, most buildings are very dynamic. Corporate facilities tend to be less dynamic in, in terms of uh, tenant improvements. Um, however, in the commercial marketplace, for example, example, you know, floors and floors of buildings get renovated every year. We do that on a on, on the best cost bid basis. The folks that that actually deliver those services really have no stake in the efficiency of the building. So the result is that we often find thermostats that have are operating a VIV box in one area um, in a totally different area, and no one can understand why so and so in office number 300B can't get cool enough or can't get hot enough, depending on the time of year that it is. So rather than going in and opening up the VIV box so that it has 100% locked in place because we put a, a clamp on it to do so, we need to start working back from root cause. And so many of the complaints based on that, 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 underlying, uh, that underlying need for building operators to reduce complaints, many of those complaints are addressed essentially to just get them out of our hair. We don't want to hear from this person again. And because our budgets are, 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 are in many cases deficient, then we're not really enabling our building operators and building engineers to do their job correctly. We're not supporting them from a training perspective so that they can stand back and say, gee, how can I really solve this problem so it's efficient from both an output standpoint and an energy standpoint? So over time, what happens in a building based on that mentality is because we're so driven by those complaints is that efficiency in general decreases. And you end up with a building engineering philosophy and an O&M philosophy that is essentially driven by Joe the tweaker. Joe the tweaker goes around and tweaks anything that he possibly can in order to create the minimal amount of complaints from the occupants of the building. So it's important to understand how that player really drives many of the things that we do in that building. So, so obviously with all these different personalities, different motivations, um, what I guess the question now is what can we do now? And I, it's pretty obvious that if we continue down the same path, like you're saying, managing uh, operating buildings the same way they've been done the past 50 years, um, another thing I've uh, I've heard you say in the past is that you know buildings are designed by rocket scientists and they're maintained by people who are far from rocket scientists and the resulting inefficiencies costs a lot of money and if there's an environmental cost as well to that so what can we change to change the outcomes in this game yeah and, th and that's a really good point because we need to understand there's a lot of conflicting motivations for each of the individuals we've talked talked about so far. Facility manager has one motivation. The occupants have a significantly opposing um, motivation. Building operators have a, a different motivation and vendors have a different motivation. So in many cases we're not all on the same page. 
And when those motivations conflict, then we lose the opportunities that we have to make buildings efficient. I, I think it goes back to that, you know, five heads are better than one, and five plus five doesn't e equal 10. It equals 15. And so if we look at ourselves and say, you know, what's going to change if we continue doing things the same way? Nothing. The outcomes are going to remain the same no matter what we do. So we need to have an understanding between all of those players that we need to work together to find the answers to efficiency and environmental issues. So, you know, the first suggestion that we would make is for a facility manager um, in any kind of a building to, to develop a strategic energy plan. What is your plan for moving forward? I mean, so often we mention that to facility managers and they say to us, well, you know, we don't have time to do that. We have tenant complaints and you know, we've got meetings with tenants and we have budget meetings and we have to review our energy efficient or our energy bills and you know we, we really need to take some time to step back and build a strategic plan. If you were going to start a business you wouldn't do it without a plan. And energy efficiency is such an important aspect of what we do. It accounts for such a large percentage of the costs in any building. So again we would encourage you to step up, step up and develop a an, uh, strategic energy and environmental plan. And there's many places where you can go for the information that you need to do that. Um, start by evaluating your situation. Um, set some milestones. Put a roadmap together and say, I want to do this by then. Engage your building engineers so they understand and become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Um, when your, your plan is complete, implement it in a thoughtful and effective manner and demand the results that you're looking for. And don't just demand them from yourself. Demand them from those who will have an impact on the building. In other words, demand them from your building engineer. Demand them from your vendors and contractors. And demand them from any independent consultants that you actually engage. And by the way, if you feel uncomfortable uh, creating a strategic energy plan, then engage an independent consultant to do that. It will pay dividends over the long haul. A one, three, five-year plan on where you want to be from an energy perspective is the only way that you're going to get where you need to go. Stephanie, I, I do want to mention the, the part about engaging your building engineers I think is critical because don't we need to create a safe environment where we can all come clean about things? I mean, if I'm a building engineer and I'm going around uh, solving complaints and, as you say, Joe the tweaker, I, I'm, you know, I, I don't want somebody crawling around under the hood and pointing out the things I may have been doing, quote, wrong, when I've really just been trying to solve problems for our tenants and our occupants. Um, it seems to me that it's very important to have that sit down and say, look, it's okay. We're going to look under the hood. I understand this isn't a a witch hunt to find what's wrong in, in building engineering. This is also solving a problem. Yeah, and you know, I think it's like any other management approach in an organization is you want to focus on the positive outcomes and positive results of behavior as opposed to using it as that witch hunt. We want to engage our building engineer to be enthusiastic participants in developing that strategic energy plan. Um, they play an important role in that, but the foundation of doing that, Wayne, is absolutely we need to make them feel comfortable in that environment. Remember, these folks have done this kind of stuff in a certain way for a long time. It's a paradigm. And you don't change paradigms overnight, and you clearly don't do it in a vacuum. You have to get those participants involved. And by doing so, by soliciting that involvement, then we're way more effective at what we can possibly do. So let's talk about education. Um, IFMA has very wisely begun to add a energy and environment component to, um, to the learning process for facility managers. 
And there's a lot of local things going on. Here in Sacramento, where we're based, we have a green building operations course that's been sponsored by the local IFMA branch and that essentially um, provides facility managers with a more sound understanding of the issues that affect energy and environmental issues and how that impacts their job performance. So I would encourage anyone on the call, if you have not done so already, to begin to become more familiar with all of those opportunities that face you. Stop relying on your building operator or your building engineer to provide you with the information that you need. Because unless you ask for it in an educated and informed way, you're not going to get the right kind of feedback. You're not going to get the right questions answered. Right now we're asking the wrong questions. We're assuming that performance in the building is really taking place and we don't really need to worry about it. So as I said, one of the ways is, is, is through education, and you can do that through IFMA, through your local chapter. The local utility companies provide a, a, an absolutely huge array of classes on energy efficiency, and many of them are free. There's no cost associated with doing that. They take maybe an hour of your time a day depending on where you're located, and you will get a bunch of free education um, and, and some, some exciting info, insights into how you can actually begin to make your building more efficient. Um, investigate opportunities with the Association of Energy Engineers. You don't need any particular um, background in, in professional engineering, although you need some facility management background to take many of the courses that AEE provides. So yes, those courses can be quite expensive, anywhere from $800 to $1,500, but they will provide you with a significantly greater insight on the kinds of things that are taking place in your building. Knowledge is power, and without it, we cannot effectively manage those individuals who work for us who have their hands on the performance uh, energy and environmental performance of the systems that are building. Take Energy Star classes. All you have to go do is go to energystar.gov and you'll find a, a huge array of classes. Um, learn about financial analysis. And this is important because if you can demonstrate the financial value of an investment in efficiency or environmental compliance up the ladder, then you're going to have a much easier time of it when the time comes for you to sell that particular particular process up the ladder. And I, I think with financial analysis too, it's important to know that most CFOs don't look at things through simple payback or even ROI. They're looking at things that are a little bit more sophisticated than that, such as modified internal rate of return, for example. So there's a lot of great books. Uh, there's actually classes that you can take on financial analysis through some of the utility companies to give you different ways to frame your solutions uh, to send them up the ladder. And I think it's important to understand what your company's corporate strategic initiatives are, align your energy plan with those initiatives, uh, and find out what your particular CFO likes to look at when they're making a financial decision uh, in, in something like this. Do they look at modified internal rate of return? Ask your vendor to provide the math for you if you can't do the math. If they're providing you with a solution, have them justified in terms, terms of, of modified internal rate so you don't have to do the work. But you should understand how it's calculated. Yeah, and you need to learn to understand the nuances of your own organization in terms of how, how that calculation needs to look. And as Wayne said, I think a really important thing is, is use your vendors. That's what they're there for. If they want to provide value to the relationship that you, they have with you and your building, then they'll provide those types of that type of information. And you know, you need to spend more time talking to your building engineer. Your building engineer has his or her hands on the pulse of your building, on all of those energy and consuming systems. And in many cases, they can teach you much about the building and how it operates. However, I would caution you to be very careful to take some of what you're told by your by your building engineer 
with a grain of salt. Understand that they are suspicious of us suddenly becoming interested in how the building operates. But let's move on from education. Let's start talking about performance management. And, and essentially, I mean, we've asked this question many times, and that is, is of, of facility managers that we work with, do you manage your building engineers with performance goals that are related to energy and efficiency? And the answer to that question is almost a universal no. It's about complaints. Uh, it's about making sure that they're on budget in terms of their, their vendor and contractor issues. They come to you, they talk to you about, uh, they come to you, they talk to you about the upgrades uh, that they need for their control systems or other inefficient systems that, that exist in the buildings. So we would encourage you to take the uh, performance goal setting, performance review process much more seriously when it comes to your building engineer and take a more uh, acute uh, focus on creating activities that create energy efficiency. And then stick to that roadmap. Do that often. Um, make sure that you um, create an understanding between yourself and your building engineer that you're looking for certain types of activities within the building. And those activities are essentially summarized in that performance review process. The other thing that we would, would encourage you to do, and this goes back to treating symptoms rather than diseases, is avoid the gadgets and gimmicks that vendors tend to come to you with. I think the, the big thing now um, in lighting systems, for instance, is uh, let's all go to uh, T5s. Um, do the math on this stuff. Make sure that it actually pays off, number one. And number two, and perhaps most importantly, make sure that it is coincidental with the plan you have in place for moving forward. Do this in a thoughtful manner. Stick to your energy and environmental plan. And if you're unclear about anything, then get an independent evaluation. So skills assessment for building operators will tend to identify weaknesses. It provides you with some understanding of how you need to budget for training. Once you have an understanding of the training that you want to apply to that, that performance-based training that, that essentially improves the activity, activities of the ONM program, once you have, an, uh, have identified what those are, then you can more adequately provide that support for your building engineer. And I, you know, I don't know a building engineer who doesn't want training, and it should be part of your budget every year, but it should be done not in that traditional sense where we're going to send you to a class that shows you how to grease and oil a motor or a fan. Those classes, if your building engineer doesn't already know that stuff, then you probably should be looking for a new building engineer. So make the training worthwhile. And then couple that with your performance review. Link the efficiency to the training and link the training and outcomes of that training to those performance reviews over time. Do a skills assessment on that particular individual to decide where you need to provide that training. Utility companies will provide you with help and it is free. We need to understand that almost universally across the United States, utility companies have what is known as a public goods surcharge. And we all pay that on our utility bill. Um, after the 2001 energy crisis in California, um, where we had brownouts and blackouts regularly for two or three weeks, the California Public Utilities Commission decided that it was a good idea to stop spending money on creating new generation and rather spend money on energy efficiency. And California, as an example, hasn't built a new energy plant in several years as a result of that. Other jurisdictions right across the, sta uh, the United States have all adopted that. So there's lots of money there for incentives and rebates. And I encourage you to take advantage of them. 
call your utility rep, have them come in, share your roadmap with them and what you want to do, and let them help you get there. Because they will be able to read your strategic plan for energy and the environment and say, gee, this is where I can help you. This is where the money will come from. And ask them if they'll fund an energy audit in your building. The last thing that you can do is perhaps start to look at whether or not you want to use independent consultation. In other words, find that consultant in your area, someone that you're comfortable with, who is an efficiency ninja, for instance. In other words, somebody who understands how buildings operate, how the interactive properties of each one of the individuals in that building actually do impact the performance of the building. Someone who can review the O&M procedures and give you some guidance as to how you might want to change that. Someone who can look at the existing systems in your building, controls and equipment. Um, someone who can perhaps perform a low level, actually level one audit, which is not an expensive audit, and give you an idea of the kinds of things you can do to create some significant energy efficiency. I will caution you that you should probably use your vendors as well. However, we need to be careful that that, that advice you're going to receive from the vendor is not going to be particularly broad. It will be self-serving. So by all means, I would encourage you to use vendors to get great information on opportunities that exist. On the other hand, make sure that those opportunities that you entertain actually meet your strategic plan objectives. And I think another important point is uh, independent consultation means just that, that the consultant uh, is not in, in beholden to a particular vendor or a group of vendors that they bring in that they're going to provide the best situation for the end user, for the customer, and, and essentially be an advocate for that end user. Energy Star, and we probably don't need to dwell here because I suspect that many of you have already been to Portfolio Manager. Many of you already understand what um, your, the benchmark for your building is. So just to re review, there's a no cost to this. You go online, you uh, provide a, a very minimal amount of information. It's a very easy system to work with. Um, and uh, you benchmark your building. Now understand when you benchmark your building in Energy Star, you are comparing your building to all the other buildings in the Energy Star um, database. You're not comparing it to the general marketplace. So those buildings that are not in the, in the database could either be really efficient or really inefficient. So you need to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. However, if you can get a 75 or above Energy Star score, then you can apply for an Energy Star label in your building. Um, in our opinion, an Energy Star score of 75 is not particularly good. Um, it leaves a lot of room for in improvement. In fact, if you are below 85 and sometimes even 90 on that Energy Star um, rating scale, there is still a fairly significant opportunity in your building to save energy, either through improved O&M procedures, uh, retrofit, retro commissioning, or any of those other systems that we're all familiar with. So go to Energy Star and do your portfolio manager and get your building benchmarked as a very first step. Um, one of the other things you can do is look at retro commissioning and the reason why we suggest it is because it's such a great way to reduce energy costs in a building with paybacks that are ridiculously fast um, that on average are extremely high um, compared to other uh, methodology and in the end information that is so valuable to you on how your building actually operates. If a retro commissioning program in your building is worth its salt, it will look at the operations and maintenance activities in the building. It will focus on where those complaints are coming from. It will provide you with repair and deferred maintenance lists that you can act upon. It will look at the opportunities for capital expenditures in your building. And in many cases, if you ask for it and for an additional 
small fee. They will even, and a retrocommissioning contractor or a consultant, will even help you build that strategic energy plan. Because the information you collect during a retrocommissioning process is so important and so integral to an energy and environmental plan that essentially when you walk away, you will have all the components that you need to create that plan for yourself. So for those of you who don't understand what retro commissioning is, and I should point out that we started our, our retro commissioning practice in 2006, and it was almost universally accepted that 99% of the people I talked to did not even know what retro commissioning was. So a good percentage of what I've done over the last six or seven years is educate people on retro commissioning. That has changed dramatically, and more, probably more dramatically in just the last couple of years than it has in the last 10. And although Energy Star and a number of other organizations within the federal government had been uh, promoting retrocommissioning as a tool, it didn't really gain pop popularity until the last couple of years. Now we see departments of the government, many private enterprise corporations, and uh, an almost universal um, embracing of retro commissioning. And the reason for that is, is it is just so effective at avoiding capital improvements and retrofits in your buildings. Remember, ESCOs, who sell performance contracts, want to change out equipment in your building. That's how they make their money. Now, those aren't always the most effective ways to deal with problems in your building. And this is particularly true, as I said earlier, with controls contractors. They want to upgrade that control system. They want to give you a DDC right to the zone. They want to give you the upgraded software package and the improved memory. Well, you need to understand that very, very little of that new equipment is going to change anything from a efficiency standpoint. Rather, the value in upgrading comes from the controls contractor changing sequences of operation, changing schedules, changing reset schedules, and making improvements to the control system that would not have otherwise been made under their contract and clearly won't be made by the ESCO. So your first line of defense in retrocommissioning is to actually go about having some licensed professionals and engineers come in and look at your building. This is not, this is not a process your building operator can do. It's really a systematic and highly detailed evaluation of how building systems interact and how they operate, either efficiently or inefficiently, and what kind of condition that they're actually in. In many cases, simple repairs and adjustments will create the same outcomes as spending $500,000 on a new control system. And you'll discover that maybe you didn't need that new control system. So an effective RCX program will also include assessment of those A1M procedures. What are the skills of the building engineer? Is he really capable of taking care of the building from a performance perspective? What maintenance tasks are being undertaken by either the internal staff or the vendors? And so retro commissioning can help you immensely in developing a terrific foundation for moving forward with energy efficiency and environmental um, outcomes. And, and since retro commissioning is such a, um, a, a detailed uh, uh, undertaking unto itself, uh, we are talking with the uh, Corporate Facilities Council about uh, just a retro commissioning only webinar to dig deeper into that and actually show you some of the things that uh, you can find and uncover uh, as well as some of the math behind a retro commissioning also. So stay tuned for uh, details on that. So if uh, there have been some questions entered into the chat box or if uh, Mary, if you'd like to moderate any questions, we'd like to take those now. Okay, I see one wants to know if we'll be able to get copies of the presentations after the training. Absolutely. And you can also hit the raise your hand button if you have any questions that uh, that way through your uh, go to meeting panel. 
Okay. We have one. Currently, I'm moving my company to a new space of very few offices. Are there metrics on how much energy these types of spaces save? I wonder if you could rephrase the, the question. Could you repeat the question, Mary? Currently, I'm moving my company to a new space that has very few offices. Are there metrics on how much energy these types of spaces save? Uh, well, I guess it depends on the building itself in terms of how much you might save. But, you know, I would caution you if you're moving into an open space, and I'm thinking that that's where the question is. If you're moving into an open space, you should have an independent consulting, a commissioning agent, work with you, the owner, to ensure that the systems in that new space actually comply with the specifications, that thermostats are where they're supposed to be, that the capacity of the systems is sufficient to um, satisfy the needs of not only the folks that are in that space, but the load that they're going to create. Remember, we've got a lot of heat uptake from computers and printers and scanners and other devices. So your commissioning agent at the contract level when you do your TIs should be able to guide you in that direction. Okay, well Mary, do you see any other questions? Um, let's see. We, this is how do we get copies of the presentation? Um, I can send it out because we also have the recording, so I can send a link to the recording and to the presentation. You're welcome, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, and if, uh, if there's any further questions beyond that, our contact information is here as well as uh, will be on the recorded webinar. And uh, we'd like to thank uh, the Corporate Facilities Council and IFMA uh, for letting us participate here. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you.